idea that I had where if we can teach young people not to take drugs, just not to take them. When it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. It's really, really easy not to take them. We did not hear what the president is going to do. We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. Words without action are nothing more than false promises. This budget that we just passed in the House today brings us one step closer to historic tax reform. Some of the things we're doing, uh, I'm sorry, are ridiculous. In the short run, uh, we will see an increase in deficit. It's the only thing that we can get through a GOP-led uh, Senate. We're really unified on what we want to do. We could take a lot of this off and throw it in the trash can. You know, people don't understand. I'm a very intelligent person. Yes, some days I feel like I need to do that. <laughs> throw up the ball. <laughs> John Boehner was the last Republican Speaker of the House before the Republican Party descended into Trumpism. John Boehner quit his job as Speaker of the House in the middle of a congressional session because he thought too many Republican House members had become disconnected from reality. When John Boehner walked off the Republican stage in disgust of his fellow Republicans in the House in October of 2015, Donald Trump was putting on a display of ignorance and buffoonery in Republican presidential debates unlike anything ever seen in American politics. And Donald Trump was constantly going up in the Republican polls. John Boehner could see that. As impossible as his job had become in those days, it was very clear to him that Trumpism meant that it was only going to get worse. And so today, in an interview in Germany, former Republican Speaker of the House John Boehner said, most average Republicans are throwing up over the fact that the knuckleheads are running this show. John Boehner didn't list the knuckleheads by name, but one of the people running the show was asked today about how the Republican tax cuts might run into trouble from a surprise tweet by the knucklehead in chief. Are you at all concerned that this rollout next week, when you actually detail these tough choices, that he's not going to maybe like some of them and tweet something about it? Oh, we should have had his answer there, not just the question. So here's what his answer is. Paul Ryan, who you were about to see on that video, uh, Speaker of the House, one of the knuckleheads running the show, according to John Boehner. Uh, he was asked, you know, do you think there might be problems if uh, Trump tweets about the tax bill while you're trying to get it done? And Ryan says, he's going to be in Asia, number one. And then he laughs. And then he says, no, I'm just kidding. And then he says, that was kind of a joke. And he says, I was sort of joking on that. Now, kind of a joke and sort of joking is not really a joke. So that means Paul Ryan was, you know, kind of saying what he meant, that the president's going to be in Asia, and he's implying that having the president out of town is the best thing for Republicans who are trying to get a tax bill passed. This week, Republican Senator Bob Corker said very clearly that he hoped the president would stop commenting on the tax bill. Is he yeah. being a distraction? Are the comments that he's making, the tweets, making it harder to get tax reform? I would let the tax writing committees uh, do their work. Um, I think both the House and Senate has done a lot of preliminary work and stay out. Of taking things off the table and really ne negotiating against the process before it even begins. The chairman of the Senate Tax Writing Committee is Utah Republican Orrin Hatch. Chairman Hatch said this, we need to know what the president wants to, to do to try to coordinate it with him. So far, I'm not quite sure where he's going. And no one is quite sure where the president is going in his newly announced war on opioids, a war that Republicans got interested in only when they discovered that white Republicans have serious addiction problems too. The basics of the president's announcement today on opioids was the familiar just say no. The fact is, if we can teach 
young people and people generally not to start. It's really, really easy not to take them. One specific action the president promised to take today was to pull a drug off the market. We are requiring that a specific opioid, which is truly evil, be taken off the market immediately. Okay, immediately, so like today or tomorrow at the latest, right? The administration confirmed that the drug that he was talking about was Opana. Apparently, no one told the president that that drug was already removed from the market in June by the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration has the regulatory authority to do that sort of thing. And that is exactly the kind of regulation that Donald Trump rails against. We're getting rid of one job-killing regulation after another. So the regulations are bad president told his regulations are bad believing followers today that he was going to use regulations to take a drug off the market that the FDA had, the FDA had already taken off the market thanks to regulations. Joining us now, Ron Klain, former chief of staff to Vice Presidents Joe Biden and Al Gore and a former senior aide to President Obama. Also with us, Daniel Dale, the Washington correspondent for the Toronto Star. And Peter Weiner, senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He worked in the last three Republican administrations. Uh, and Ron, the knuckleheads are running the show. This is not something I've ever heard a previous Democratic Speaker of the House uh, look back at Washington and say about the people he left behind. Yeah, because it hasn't been true before. I mean, like watching Paul Ryan today and Republican leaders say they want Donald Trump not involved in tax reform it is like watching Shep and Curley saying that Mo isn't qualified to be a stooge. <laughs> I mean, it is just craziness. And it's not a surprise though, Lawrence. You have to remember, we all remember, that it was Donald Trump who really single-handedly botched the Republican effort to repeal Obamacare. He did the wrong things when the bill was in the House. He then said the House bill was too mean. He threatened Republican senators. You know, he was a one-man wrecking crew on that legislation. So it's no surprise that Paul Ryan wants him in Asia, if not someplace farther away, when the House does the work on this bill. Peter, compare that uh, to President George W. Bush uh, pushing uh, his tax cut bills that he was uh, obviously a very important force in. Yeah, well, President Bush got the tax cut bill through. He got education uh, through. He got Medicare prescription drugs through. He got a lot through. Uh, and other presidents have gotten a lot through. Uh, the anomaly here is Donald Trump and the Trump presidency and the Trump administration because they are utterly inept. Uh, but the, but the, the really the focal point of the ineptness is Donald Trump himself. He doesn't know anything and he doesn't care that he doesn't uh, know anything. It is an extraordinary thing. Uh, you know, your old boss, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in 1981, wrote a piece in the New York Times where he said the GOP has, of a sudden, become the party of ideas. 35 years later, they have become, in large part, the party of anti-ideas. There is a deep contempt um, for policy uh, and for ideas and for the intellectual side and the governance side of uh, politics that explains how Donald Trump got the nomination and now we're seeing it unfold in real time and there's a cost to it. And then Peter as you recall uh, Senator Moynihan was opposed to most of the Republican ideas and what he was talking about was the failure of his own party at that time to meet the new Republican ideas That's of Reaganism right. with a new set of a new kind of energetic approach by Democrats. Uh, Daniel how does it land in this White House? That when uh, you have a former Speaker of the House, Republican Speaker of the House, saying uh, the knuckleheads are running the show, is that just another, that land like another tweet to them? Because in any previous White House, it would be the most devastating comment made that year or, or that entire presidential term. I think we know from what we've seen of Trump in public that he himself will be raging about this. He'll be raging about former Senator Tom Coburn saying in the New York Times today that he has a personality disorder. We know that, that this bothers him personally. I think to the White House, though, it's, it's easy to dismiss this as the, you know, the, the grumbling of the, the establishment that he is supplanting. Um, so it's easy to spin it publicly. And I think they're used to everyone yelling at them. And I think privately, a lot of them know that a lot of these criticisms of the president 
president and and of the people he's put around him are true but you know they've chosen to be there themselves and they're they're trying to power through uh, we have a poll about uh, the knuckleheads running the show. This is the YouGov poll. It says 87 percent, to put that up there, 87 percent say that Donald Trump says things that are untrue. That's if you add up uh, everyone uh, th there who says all the time, often, sometimes. Uh, on Republicans, it's actually 63 percent. So, uh, so, Ron, you've got a majority of Republicans uh, who who answer the question how often does Donald Trump say things that are untrue and you know th this very big group there 47 percent saying sometimes 11 percent saying often uh, they just accept that apparently I think they accept it I think obviously Trump's core supporters accept it but Lawrence we are starting to see for the first time really in an unprecedented thing since Watergate members of the president's own party Bob Corker, Jeff Flake, John McCain, say that this man is just unqualified, unfit, unable to be president. And, uh, you know, we kind of let that slide by last week as if it was just normal to have senior members of the president's own party in the Senate say that the president of the United States is unfit to be president. It's not normal. It's extraordinary. And Trump's incompetence and erraticism is taking its toll. And even some Republicans now are speaking out. And, and Peter, I, I, I want to go back to the, the point you made about uh, what Senator Moynihan said about Ronald Reagan. It's a, Barack Obama echoed it, actually, in his first presidential campaign. There came a moment where uh, Barack Obama talked about Reagan actually having the right. ideas that kind of dominated uh, in right. the 1980s in, in his era. Uh, and, and when we look at this era, uh, we're seeing uh, the, the one idea that seems to be clear enough to describe, uh, anyway, is tax cuts. Uh, but at the same time, there's a, a massive violation of an old Republican prin principle of not increasing the debt, not increasing uh, the deficit, which some Republicans have been willing to do under some circumstances. But this is the most flagrant version of it yet. And, and so... I wonder how people will describe this period in Republicanism when it comes to ideas. Oh, it's it's going to be devastating. Uh, it, it's going to be that the cupboard was was uh, empty. As I said, it, it's, it's not simply they don't have the ideas. There seems to be within some parts of the Republican Party, certainly in the person of Donald Trump, a kind of contempt for ideas. They they view politics as theatrics, not politics as governance. And there's almost a prideful disdain uh, of it. We, we saw during the campaign, you know, during these um, debates, Donald Trump couldn't string together three coherent policy sentences. And this was not a state secret that he didn't know these things. It was advertised and people saw it and they didn't care about it. And there was something else about him, his personality and, and this theatrical side of politics, the grievance side of politics. Um, that attracted people. Donald Trump is a serious problem. He's president, but the fact that so many Republicans, the Republican base, were attracted to him and are staying committed to him, despite the fact that we know what he is like, um, is is an even deeper problem in some respects. Ron Klain, Daniel Dale, Peter Weiner, thank you all for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Coming up. Mitch McConnell strikes back. We have never seen this kind of warfare inside a political party. And today, Republicans continued their forced march toward tax cuts, which is sacrificing one of what they claim to be their most important principles. There is open warfare inside the Republican Party, and so, of course, the president tweeted this morning, do not underestimate the unity within the Republican Party, and it's so much unity that he has to use uppercase letters for every letter of the word unity. He did that after waking up to a Washington Post front page lead story under the headline, Republicans Target Bannon. The story said allies of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell declared open warfare on Wednesday against Stephen K. Bannon, the former White House chief strategist and leader of an insurrection aimed at defeating mainstream Republican candidates in next year's midterm elections. We have never seen warfare like this inside a party. Anyone who tries to tell you that the Democrats have ever experienced anything this bad is simply wrong. And we have never seen anyone like 
Stephen Bannon trying to destroy a political party. Right now, it's a season of war against a GOP establishment. So all of you folks that are so concerned that you're going to get primaried and defeated, you know, there's time for mea culpa. You can come to a stick, a microphone, and you can say, I am not going to vote for Mitch McConnell for majority leader. The Washington Post story tells us a super PAC aligned with McConnell reveals plans to attack Bannon personally as it works to protect GOP incumbents facing uphill primary fights. The effort reflects the growing concern of Republican lawmakers over the rise of anti-establishment forces and comes amid escalating frustration over President Trump's conduct, which has prompted a handful of lawmakers to publicly criticize the president. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's former chief of staff, Josh Holmes told The Hill, in 2018, we ought to revisit this question and find out if these people are still happy to be associated with Bannon. When you're facing voters, I'd take one of the most successful majority leaders in history over a white supremacist any day. Joining us now, Charlie Sykes, author of the new book, How the Right Lost Its Mind, and an MSNBC contributor, and Anna Marie Cox, host of the podcast with friends like these. Uh, and Anna, they have shown on the McConnell team that they intend to go after Trump personally. They are going to publicly label, label him a white supremacist and an anti-Semite based on information revealed by his wife in their divor divorce proceedings that he opposed uh, his daughters going to a certain school in Los Angeles because he said there were too many Jews there. Uh, they are going to make Steve Bannon personally the issue for Republicans who associate with him. Uh, I actually really appreciated uh, you misspoke just a tiny bit at the opening there and you said uh, Trump they're gonna hold Trump personally responsible and that would actually be the thing that might make a difference right um, yeah. because right now yeah. I mean I'm, I'm not sure like going after Bannon uh, the your average you know voter still probably doesn't think of him as like a superpower player. I mean, this is really, this is inside baseball that's erupted into an outside brawl, right? Um, and I, I think the... the knuckleheads and um the problem is though that because we live in such a gerrymandered country right now these knuckleheads could win um even if even if they're knuckleheads so i'm really concerned here and i, I unfortunately don't see any winners at all in this situation except for i guess maybe some knuckleheads well charlie um, I don't know, i'd be very interested yeah. <laughs> to hear what charlie yeah. has to say <laughs> charlie the democrats are very happy to see just how how much uh, money and oh, resources yeah. the republicans are going to have to spend in their primary elections before they stagger into the general election against a democrat in the first senate race yeah well, they, they, they ought to be. I mean, what a bizarre threesome when you think about it, this, uh, this triangulation that's going to go on. Look, you know, Steve Bannon is, 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 a, you know, is a nihilistic troll whose only goal appears to be to tear down the Republican establishment. But I think that Donald Trump sees him kind of as his enforcer. So I, I think the dynamic that's being created right here, and we saw this during the campaign, is that, is, is that Donald Trump always has some muscle off at the side. You know, somebody who is, uh, you know, the, the flying monkeys and the trolls who are going to go after you if you do not support him. And I think Lindsey Graham actually did capture the dynamics of this when he said, look, this is why we have to pass this tax bill. Uh, this is why we have to pass uh, th this budget, because if we don't pass this tax budget, the Bannonites are coming for us. So it's not, we're not talking about just the public policy or the Democrats. This now becomes the insurance policy against the, the, the Bannonites bringing back crazy town into the Republican Party. Uh, Anna, here's something that no candidate for the Senate wants. A staff person associated with his campaign or her campaign who is more famous than the candidate. And that's where <laughs> Steve Bannon stands tonight in relation to all of the candidates he wants to support. Yeah, I, I, I mean... Yeah, he is a nihilist. Um, I don't really understand, like, what his ultimate goal is. I mean, I guess... Um 
he has this sort of weird uh, history with, uh, with the rise of, of, of some kind of nationalism. I mean, he wouldn't call it white nationalism, but he certainly believes in, in a vision of America that, that is not um, the democratic one we have today. I don't know if that's actually possible. I am concerned because, as Charlie said, I mean, the, the, this is a win-win for him if, if he gets to play enforcer because he either elects these people who are going to enact these what I think are objectively bad policies or he, he frightens the good Republicans into enacting um, what they seem to admit are not great policies. They're only enacting them in order not to get primaried, right? That's not much of an argument right. for tax reform, really, um, or health care reform or any other kind of reform. Um, and again, I just am concerned that, that, that yes, they're going to they're be spending money on these primaries, and yes, they, they might um, get some real knuckleheads in there, but I'm concerned that Democrats won't be able to do anything with that opportunity because of you know voter suppression gerrymandering um, all the kinds of like you know dirty tricks that we have in the modern day world of politics i'm hopeful um but you know yeah, not not very optimistic. Senate elections go ahead charlie yeah. yeah yeah that won't that won't affect that won't affect uh senate elections because those, those of course can't be be gerrymandered yeah. you know but i but i do but i do think it's it's an interesting strategy and i understand i mean mcconnell's folks are very very frustrated about bannon and what bannon is doing and they feel they have to push back on the other hand you know trying to imagine the republican primary electorate that that you know trying to convince them that bannon is not acceptable but Trump is acceptable. I mean, this is an electorate that is okay with Donald Trump. They were okay with his with his promotion of of Steve Bannon. So I guess I'm a little bit skeptical about how effective that's going to be. And by the way, one race to watch this will be in my home state of Wisconsin, where Steve Bannon has decided to parachute in. He has endorsed a Republican candidate, Kevin Nicholson, in this particular race. And I'm guessing that his support for uh, one of the candidates will be an issue in this race. And I'm not sure it will be an asset uh, here in Wisconsin for. Uh, for, for Nicholson. Anna, I, I know you were uh, tweeting your responses to the president's speech today about opioids, and I just wanted to give you a chance here uh, to respond on what the, to what the president had to say today. Uh, yes. Well, you know, as someone who's in recovery, uh, you know, there's nothing quite so wonderful as being lectured about uh, just saying no by someone who's very boastfully a teetotaler, of course. Um, not that he would be any better if he had had uh, some experience with drugs or alcohol. Um, my favorite part, though, was when he said this was his idea. It was his idea that maybe if we did a bunch of advertising about, you know, how terrible drugs are, then maybe kids would never try them. Abstinence uh, is, is not a policy that has worked as uh, uh, something to keep kids away from sex, and it's not going to keep kids away from drugs. Uh, and it, it actually sort of harkens back not just to the policies of an era that largely is considered a disaster. The war on drugs um, cost a lot of money and put a lot of people in jail, um, but is actually kind of retrograde. It does a lot of harm um, to put to put our fight in the opioid epidemic in terms of a moral contest um, in terms of some things are good and some things are bad. Uh, I, I get angry a lot about this, what this president has to say. Um, I think a lot of, of the policies or lack of policies that he talks about endanger people's well-being and health. And I, I thought that his health care bill you know, would definitely kill people. Um, this is yet another example of where his kind of cavalier and callous attitude towards what are the real facts on the ground, I mean, is going to get people killed. Um, there are already, you know, thousands of Americans dying, 175 a day, as he said. And um, telling these people that our big plan, what he called the biggest, most important part of the, uh, uh, of the plan, is a really big, really huge, really great advertising campaign, um, I think speaks to... Um, I mean, you know, I'm in recovery, so I always want to think things are going to get better. So I'm just going to I'm going to hold on to hope um, that there are people out there that know better than he does. And that's where the solution is going to come from, because it has to come from somewhere. Yes. And the war on drugs is still putting a lot of people in jail. We're going to talk about that yeah. later in the program. Anna Marie Cox, Charlie Sykes, thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, it has been one full week now since John Kelly went into the White House press briefing room and told a completely untrue story about Congresswoman Frederica Wilson. And he still 
has not apologized. Congressional Republicans continued to show remarkable weakness in their forced march toward tax cuts today. The budget resolution that paves the way for those tax cuts passed the House of Representatives in a remarkably close vote of 216 to 212, with 20 Republicans voting against it and all Democrats voting against it. Tax cuts are supposed to be the one thing that all Republicans always agree on. They all vote for it, but not anymore. Support for the Republican tax cuts in the House is even weaker than that vote indicated because Republicans from states with higher taxes in those states are opposed to a Republican pro proposal to eliminate the federal deductibility of state and local taxes. And that's why House Republicans from New York State, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania opposed the resolution. But all 14 of the Republican members of Congress from California voted for the resolution today, which doesn't actually cut the taxes. It just sets up the parliamentary procedure for cutting the taxes. Now, all of those 14 California votes could be lost if the tax bill does eliminate state and local tax deductibility, which is now the single most controversial aspect of the Republican tax bill, and that would be a tax increase in all of those states. Every Republican who voted for the budget resolution today voted against his or her principles, which is no surprise now that the Republican Party has become the Trump Party and principles have absolutely no meaning. They don't even pretend to have any meaning to Republicans anymore. The principle that they all violated today was fiscal conservatism. They all voted to dramatically increase the deficit and the national debt, something they all ran against. And no one's been noisier about that in the past than Congressman Mark Meadows. He claims to be a principled anti-deficit conservative, one of the most conservative members of the House. He voted for this resolution. Here he is this morning confessing to violating his principles. You're right, the deficit continues to increase, and certainly as we look at tax reform, uh, the $1.5 trillion that's in the Senate budget that will pass later today in the House, uh, you know, it, it does not shed a good light in terms of the deficit. Cuts. Here he is claiming that the tax cut that will explode the deficit and dramatically increase the national debt is fiscally responsible. Today, we passed a budget that is fiscally responsible, it strengthens our national defense, and it's really good for taxpayers. This budget that we just passed in the House today brings, brings us one step closer to historic tax reform. Joining us now, Stan Collender, contributor, contributor to Forbes magazine. He's one of the few people who has served on the staffs of both the House and Senate budget committees. Also with us, Josh Barrow, senior editor for Business Insider and an MSNBC contributor. Uh, and Stan, we have come a long way in our politics that a, a giant tax cut that uh, explodes the deficit and, and dramatically increases the national debt can be called by someone like Paul Ryan fiscally responsible. Well, in one sense, it's just a continuation of uh, tax cuts that we've had under the Reagan administration, under the Bush administration. Uh, remember, Reagan had to sign 10 tax increases afterwards to get the deficit back down. This one is not going to be just the biggest tax cut in history. It's going to be the biggest increase in the deficit and debt uh, that we've seen from any president legislated increase uh, probably in history. I, I think we're talking about a permanent increase uh, to a permanent annual deficit of about a trillion dollars. Uh, Josh, I was surprised at how close that vote was in the House today, uh, and it could have been worse, obviously, if the California delegation uh, didn't all just hold hands and say, we will vote to allow this to go forward, but we know that the California delegation is opposed to the elimination of state and local deductibility. 
It was close, although if you watched the vote happening, what you saw was there were a number of members, especially from the New York area, who were waiting to see, make sure that there were going to be enough votes to pass the budget. And then they went and voted no. So it's clear that leadership gave permission to a number of people that they could vote against the budget so they could go back into New York and New Jersey and places like that and talk about how they opposed eliminating the state and local tax deduction. So I think partly, you know, there were never going to be a lot more votes than you needed to pass the budget. Now, that said, the budget resolution is the easy part of this. They got this done with health care several months ago. The budget resolution isn't a law. It's just a framework that allows Congress to go pass a law later that would have the tax cuts. So they're going to have to have that fight over the state and local tax deduction and over dozens, hundreds of little provisions that are going to have opposition either from communities like people who pay a lot of state and local taxes in places like New York, businesses with particular interests about things that will get changed in the corporate income tax. So I think like with health care, we're going to see this was the easiest part. And then once they come out with this bill on November 1st that actually has the detail about what they're going to do, it's going to become a lot harder to get enough people to agree to pass something. Let's listen to uh, one Republican, uh, Leonard Lance from New Jersey, who voted no. New Jersey sends more funds here per capita and gets less back than any state in the nation. And it's very important to the people of New Jersey that uh, we continue to have the ability to deduct state and local taxes. Stan, is, do you think this bill is in trouble? I mean, technically, uh, they have enough time uh, to, to get it done, but I am surprised at how much trouble they've had. And, of course, they've got the president tweeting out his opposition to certain elements of the bill whenever he feels like it. Yeah, uh, well, Josh is right. I mean, the, the real problem here is not going to be the budget or was never going to be the budget. It was going to be the actual tax bill. And in addition to state and local tax deductibility, we've got the 401k problem uh, where, where the president says he's against doing anything that would hurt 401ks. But uh, Chairman Brady of the Ways and Means Committee says it's still a live option. And every time one of these uh, these provisions goes down, every time they, they realize, the leadership realizes they can't go forward with them, the bill gets more and more costly, at which point the Freedom Caucus, which so far has shown itself to be a bunch of hypocrites on this, at, the, at some point the Freedom Caucus is just going to throw up its hands and say we cannot agree to a deficit that's this large. Josh, I'm not so sure about the Freedom Caucus. I mean, what they agreed to today, what they went along with today, uh, was a pretty <laughs> stunning choice. Right, but it's, it's not just about what they're willing to agree to. It's about what this says. This sets out the framework that governs what kind of law they can pass in the coming months. And so it says they can have a tax cut that grows the deficit by about a trillion and a half dollars over a decade. But they want to do about five trillion dollars worth of tax cuts when you add up the things they want to do on corporate tax, on small businesses that are taxed through the individual income tax code, individual income tax cuts, getting rid of the death tax or the estate tax. Uh, so the way that they've, they've designed it to do that is that they'll do those five trillion or so in tax cuts, and they're going to have three and a half trillion or so in tax increases, things like getting rid of the state and local tax deduction, getting rid of personal exemptions that allow every taxpayer to deduct $4,050 simply for living and breathing. If those provisions become politically impossible to do, you can't do those pay-fors, then you have to lose offsetting tax cuts. So I think they'll pass something in the end, but you could do something that was just a small or smallish across the board tax cut, much less ambitious than the tax reform that they've proposed to do, um, and you could do that without raising taxes on anybody. That was sort of the approach in the Bush tax cut in 2001. George W. Bush sold that as a tax cut for everyone who pays income taxes, which was true. So you could take that approach. It would just have to be a lot smaller. You couldn't do stuff like they're saying they're going to do. You couldn't cut the corporate income tax rate to 20. You couldn't repeal the estate tax. So I think they could end up there. But it's not just about them having pangs of conscience about how much they grow the deficit. They made rules for themselves that will actually be difficult to follow in the coming months. But Donald Trump has promised the biggest tax increase in history. So I don't know if he's going to follow the Josh Tax Barrow cut. formula. Stan Collender and Josh Barrow, thank you both for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, Republicans have a new attitude toward the war on drugs now that they see how many white Republicans have addiction problems. A Republican president launched the war on drugs in 1971. There is no war that America has lost more spectacularly than the war on drugs, America's most expensive war. Every Republican president since Nixon has continued the war on drugs, which they saw as a war to be waged on both the sellers of drugs and very much the consumers of drugs. Indeed, the consumers of drugs have suffered the most in the war on drugs. 
Democratic presidents continued the war on drugs, but with rhetoric that was never as harsh about the consumers of the drugs as the Republican rhetoric. rhetoric. The only sane response to drug addiction is treatment, not arrest. And only now, after 46 years of the failed Republican-launched war on drugs, have Republicans finally, for the first time ever, shifted their focus to treatment now that they've discovered that so many of their white Republican voters have deadly addiction problems. This epidemic is a national health emergency. Unlike many of us, we've seen and what we've seen in our lifetimes. Nobody has seen anything like what's going on now. As Americans, we cannot allow this to continue. It is time to liberate our communities from this scourge of drug addiction. Never been this way. We can be the generation that ends the opioid epidemic. We can do it. Joining us now is Echo Yaniga, professor of law at Cardozo School of Law. And uh, Professor, you've written about this, and I want to get your reaction to the president saying, we've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's bittersweet, right? It, as you pointed out, it took not just a generation, but two generations of lost bodies, and not accidentally lost brown bodies before we decided that, um, wow, this is really something we've never seen anything like this. Um, it's to ignore that we have very much seen something like this before. And the, the stop and frisk movement in law enforcement was all about seeing if you could find any kind of seed or crumb of, of any kind of illicit drug in someone's pocket. And that would be arrest. That wouldn't be anything other than arrest. And now you're seeing in these white communities all over the country, the police department saying, if you're having a problem with this, come to us and we absolutely will not arrest you we will help you get treatment look let's be very clear the war on drugs was a war on minorities is a war on in particular young black men and it was a war that was motivated by the panic of keeping drugs out of our neighborhood it was not a war about saving those who are addicted to drugs whatever they did in those neighborhoods could be cordoned off with militarized policing so long as it didn't cross into our neighborhoods and now People look and they say, wait a minute. Uh, as one police officer um, said eloquently, these are real people with souls. And I don't know why I didn't see that before. Do you see any hope of this, of this new sympathy for the white victims of addiction? extending beyond just the white victims. Actually, I'm, I have to admit, I'm even startled and in, in a bit of whiplash because what we heard from the president today was the combination of, as you say, sympathy and real human humanity, humanizing people. Indeed, he spoke about his brother mm -hmm. and, and his loss to um, alcohol addiction. So that is um, a wonderful step forward. But then all the policies he suggested, to the extent he suggested policies, were sort of a replay from, from uh, generations past. So for me, it's sort of the worst of both worlds, right? It's a loss of real humanity across the board, but then the solutions seem remarkably antiquated. Um, I, I'm, I really think it's the worst of both worlds in a way. We're going to have to leave it there for tonight. Echo, Yanka, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. It. Tonight's last word is next. It has now been one full week since John Kelly stood in the White House press briefing room and angrily told a story about Congresswoman Frederica Wilson that turned out to be completely untrue. Every bitter, angry word of it. He refused to give the congresswoman the dignity of her own name when he was telling that story. He dehumanized her by repeatedly referring to her as an empty barrel. And since then, Maisha Johnson, whose husband, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, was killed in combat, said this about Congresswoman Wilson. Whatever Ms. Wilson said was not fabricated. What she said was 100% correct. Every day since John Kelly was exposed as not telling the truth about Congresswoman Wilson has been a day that he has shamed himself by not having the simple decency to apologize.
What John Kelly is counting on and what the Trump White House is counting on is that we will forget this. And I promise you that most of the White House press corps 